Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. No script. How about that? That's <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sean, story time. It's, it's story time, and uh, it's a, a story in a, in a new channel that uh, is very meaningful for this industry. It, it's the leadership role for pretty much everything re- related to uh, security operations, security management, and response, the whole shoot and match. And it's a role that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. And it's and also a role that apparently take a lot of responsibility. And ton a lot of, of ton pressure. of weight on the shoulders for this role, <laughs> uh, which is why I love this channel. Um, yeah. I often say uh, it's, it's a role that I don't know that I could handle <laughs> personally. <laughs> and uh, tremendous respect for those who, who've who put that hat on and, and worn it for so many years. Yeah. And uh, we have a very special guest joining us today uh, who has the honor of being the first ever Chief Information Security Officer. Steve Katz, thanks for uh, joining us. Hi, Steve. Oh, my, uh, I, I, it's my absolute pleasure. It, um, you know, it's so great to be part of something that really, at, at its very beginning, at its very genesis, so I, almost, almost pre-embryonic. Uh, <laughs> when I came out of university, I was fortunate enough to get a job at an internal consulting group at First National City Bank, which ultimately became Citicorp, which ultimately became Citigroup. And among the things we were doing then was putting together uh, standards and processes for system development life cycles. And then we also formed a small internal uh, system quality assurance function. And one of the things we, that we, I pushed really hard for was to include ID and password modules in COBOL code and in Fortran code. And by today's standards, they're absolutely ludicrous because there were nothing more than uh, clear text pass, clear text tables in, in, uh, in code. And, you know, anyone who compiled the code would see the, you know, see the uh, tables and uh, you would update them by doing a recompile and added, added or deleted uh, users. But it, by, in today's standards, it was a joke. But what it allowed me to do is, you know, suddenly get some respect for the thing of uh, information or data protection. Yeah. And you know what, Steve, that just, just to start from the beginning, uh, first of all, I want to thank our common friend, Diana Kelly, that introduced us. And uh, we, we <laughs> asked her, actually, um, because we started this new series called A CISO Story, if she had some good connections, to say, wait a minute, I have the first CISO. And I was like, this is like the big bang. Right. I, I, I want to know about this because <laughs> like, as many times, Sean, we spoke about with other that have been in the industry for a long time. You never know when a role really become an official role in this industry. And uh, that goes for a security architect, uh, for a cryptographer, for many, many function in the industry. But I think even more for a CISO which I think is still like that role that we're still defining. We're still trying to figure out what, what really is, right? Is it a business role? Is it, is it a technical role? Is it a merge of, of the two? So for me, this is really an important, an important uh, piece of the story because, Steve, how do you define yourself as the first? Is it, who decided that? Did you decide that? <laughs> no, I, I wish I was smart enough to say yes. Uh, <laughs> a city bank... Uh, was hacked in 1994. $10 million went across, the international funds transfer system was hacked. It was in a tech vax environment. Uh, and it was broken into by a couple of uh, fine young gentlemen out of St. Petersburg who were looking to get some free dial-up service and realized they were in this uh, funds transfer system. And what they got into was a, a development data center for international funds transfer. Production data was being used, production uh, security was, was in place, so they just wandered around and found whatever they wanted. And then we were, were able to bounce from there into the uh, production data, uh, production environment itself. Roughly $10 million moved across the wires, but only 400,000 actually uh, was an actual loss. The, a couple of uh, data entry uh, clerical staff in South America took a look at 
at uh, Green Bar Paper at the time and said, gosh, my clients don't make transactions like that. And they escalated it and it made it up the chain. And <clears throat> the decision was made by both uh, by city, by First National City Bank or City Corp leadership uh, to work with the authorities and to figure out what was going on and to monitor through the traffic and uh, uh, pick up folks who are coming in to actually uh, collect the money at various banks around the world. But it was lesson one in terms of, uh, I guess, restating a lesson, you don't use production data in a uh, development environment. The control zone is great. It was supposed to be an encrypted, you know, encrypted traffic. It wasn't. But, it, and the detail, we brought it to the direct attention of the board of directors. And the board made a decision, uh, and directed the CEO to find and recruit a data security uh, executive. And, after, and uh, I actually, when I was recruited in there, and it took, the recruiting process took a solid six months. But I was really too down, uh, you know, my boss reported into John Reed. So, and then it's a dotted line, uh, informal line to the general auditor and the city also had something called the Windows on Risk Committee, which met with a precursor of the risk committees of the boards. And they met uh, three times a year. It was one of these uh, eight in the morning to late at night meetings with, you know, the elite of city. If you picture this, it's almost like uh, King Arthur's round table. Uh, <laughs> John Reed sat in the center. The next year were his seven direct reports. The next year were their reports. And it was an incredibly arduous and challenging kind of uh, place to present because uh, they drilled down. You know, they had to get a prep book a week in advance. They read it. They studied it. Uh, after any presentation, they issued uh, uh, action items and follow-up and we had to include that in the prep. And there were really intensely focused on, uh, on risk in general and reporting into them every four months was required a heck of a lot of prep, uh, preparation, but they were really well prepared. And sitting in the outer ring with the CIOs of the various businesses, so organizationally I was probably outranked them, but uh, they had no trouble throwing out some incredibly challenging questions. And uh, so security, security risk was taken very seriously. But sort of if I turn the clock back, uh, I helped start the data security program at Morgan Guaranteed Trust, which became JP Morgan, which became JP Morgan Chase. Uh, and we evolved it from uh, you know, selecting the correct mainframe security product, in their case, RACF, and then watched the industry grow and uh, mainframes became you know, increasingly powerful, but we also brought in the mid-range processors, the uh, digital equipment, uh, uh, technology, the AS 400s, and tried to figure out security for them. And along came the piece, uh, the personal computer, and the CIOs were saying, "Nope, they're not coming in." And the uh, the trading desk said, "Yep, we hear you," and went out and bought what they wanted, and and uh, uh, just expensed it. But we put together a program which was, by t again, by today's standards and today's uh, technology, extraordinarily simple. I mean, my, the uh, help desk was my secretary's phone. Uh, the backup was when we went to lunch, we had a, uh, a little tape recording uh, answering machine on the telephone. You know, long story short, uh, once the objections to the to personal computing went away, the next level of objection was you can't, you can't network them. The next, uh, next issue was you can't connect to the mainframes. All of that sort of said, uh, challenges were going to change. Uh, what Morgan did at the time, which was, you know, uh, really a step ahead, is they set up a global dial-in network, uh, also to their funds transfer system. And they would, you know, corporate treasurers, vice presidents of uh, finance, and various, uh, you know, uh, customers would be able to dial in and picture the pain of dialing in an 18 board modem. Make, make, uh, make that sound for us, Steve. What's that modem sound like? <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, I'll, I'll actually want, I'm going to pause you for a second. I want to go back to to City because, well, first I'm going to comment on the JP Morgan. You, you, I'm sure what you described, you would call 
the first shadow IT, right? Those personal computers coming in, that's the, the, the current day shadow IT. I'm sure that's what you called yeah. it back then. But uh, going back to city, and you, you described the, what is it, the triannual meetings uh, with the executives and the board. And it, it seems like they were very in tune and very aware and very interested in understanding risk. And it, it seems like, like they had a, now obviously there was a huge event and maybe this is something we can touch on an event around information drove interest in that perhaps, but it seems like we're still challenged today with getting the executive team and the board of directors interested in, in understanding information risk and dealing with mitigation for that risk um, before it becomes a, an incident response uh, engagement. So what are, what are your thoughts on those early days? It, what, what drove their interest besides the event or was it the event that, that actually drove? The event was part of it, but part, uh, part of my foundational, you know, foundation for data security and information security at Morgan and then at City was information security is a business risk management issue, which probably led to me being hired by, uh, by City. Because my, my lens was always one of uh, IT doesn't have risk, data security doesn't have risk, businesses have risk. And it has to be understood at a, at a business level. What is the business problem we are solving? What is the so what of any solution that we are proposing? What is the so what of any risk, of any metric that we, we bring up? Uh, why is it important? And if we don't have a why is it important to the business, it doesn't matter. Uh, the challenge that the current that CISOs have, unfortunately, and it's been going on going way back to the 80s. Uh, I think you mentioned earlier that uh, information security sort of evolved from security architects and technology architects and solid technologists. Uh, we all learn a language and technologists learn to speak to, learn to speak technology, uh, and they're outstanding. Uh, but if you look at security as a technology issue, you're never going to begin to solve it. You're going to say, I, I've got a bright new tool, I'm going to put it on. I have a new tool, I'm going to put it on. Uh, and when something goes wrong, uh, and it will, and when there's a breach, and there will be one, if the CISO hasn't established a really solid record of credibility, in meeting with the members of the C-suite and the board, uh, his successor will. It is, it's a job that has to be learned. It is, you know, if I mentor a lot of C current CISOs, I've been mentoring CISOs for uh, probably 25, 20 some odd years. Uh, I've been doing it pro bono. I also found out I get paid for it, so it's even better. Uh, but the mentoring is incredibly important. And when I speak to a, a CISO wannabe, and, and then, again, if they're technologists, the first the question I want to ask is, okay, you have the best safety net in the world. You are, you are a technological expert. That can't be taken away from you. If you get ticked off with your manager or you get ticked off with the company or you get fired, within a couple of three weeks, you will have a job that is at least as good or better than the one you, you had. Why do you want to give that up? You know, you, you want to go, you, you're a technological expert. And if you move into the CISO role, assuming you can develop the soft skills that are necessary, the negotiating skills, your bu financial skills, the budgeting skills, uh, the marketing skills, the evangelizing skills, yeah, and on and on. Uh, assuming you can successfully do that, you go, your, your technological expertise will be, go from expert to proficient, to knowledgeable. And you may never be able to climb that hill again. So before... Steve, I want, I want to ask you, because you, you mentioned language, and, and it's one thing to... I know a few words in Spanish or Italian, and I might string a barely poorly constructed sentence together in <laughs> something other than English. Right. Um, and, I, and I might <laughs> even be able to hear somebody speak something in French and, and understand what they're mm -hmm. trying to convey. Um, that doesn't mean I'm fluent. 
in that language. And part of it is I'm not immersed in it. Part of it is maybe I just don't have a desire or passion to mm -hmm. learn that right now. So my question to you is, is it okay to, and I, I think I know the answer, but I like your perspective from your time over the years. What, what do CISOs need to do to actually understand the language of business? And, and are we, are we going about it the wrong way perhaps with starting with technology as our first language for the CISO or should we be have CISOs with the business language as their primary language? There is not a, there's nothing wrong with starting out with technology as a primary language or starting out as uh, uh, compliance as your initial language, which gets probably worse than technology. Uh, but you have to be willing to one say, do I want to really shift my career? Uh, do I really want to learn? I, I, the job of the CISO, and I, I would almost say the job bifurcating, and I fortunately have to have the first time, you know, first word of the title, but I would sort of split it in today's world. Uh, it's hard to find people who can speak tech speak and business speak at the, you know, at the same time. Or, or different audiences, but have that capability. Uh, so I would see this almost, you know, bifurcating, and we have a chief information risk officer and a chief information security technology officer. The what and the why would be the chief information risk officer. The how would be the chief information security technology officer. And then the CIRO would also verify as a how met the what and the why. Mm. And the CIRO would also be the person communicating with the board, communicating with the executive suite. That person would hopefully be technologically aware, uh, technologically knowledgeable, uh, and would be smart enough and astute enough to have one of his direct reports be the equivalent of a chief technology officer in a company. We'll do the translating for him back and forth. This will be a recognition that, hey, he's a good visionary. He sees where the, where the puck is going. Uh, he's able to explain situations to the board and tell a story that boards or executive suites would, be, you know, would understand uh, and would, would direct and lead a team, and would certainly direct and lead a team. He, he or she would be running a business within, within a business. Mm. You and know, the, the, go ahead. No, no, I, I just love this because it's the first time, actually, I, we spoke with many C, so it's the first time that, yes, we hear like all this pressure, all this need to communicate to the tech side and the business side and, and the human side. And, you know, as you say, you know, it's, it's not just about technology, obviously, it's about humanity and, and relationship with people mm -hmm. and, and understanding the business. And then you go in and you pretty much tell us, you know, you, you, cannot, you need a team. And I'm thinking like in advertisement, right? When you have the copywriter and you have the, the, the visual artists and they work together to deliver that because n no one can do each other's job. And I don't know, maybe, maybe we're expecting too much from the CISO figure to be able to speak these two languages, maybe three languages, as Sean was saying. And I think this is a very, very important message at this point. And, and which bring me to ask you, was it a lot easier before or was just a different job? Did it get more complex as things get more complicated, IoT and, and a bunch of other things? Uh, or, or has it always been as, as tough as it is now? It, is, it was easier and tougher at the same time. The position I was in was you have a blank check, go build the best information security department in the world. Just go make it happen. And the other challenge we had is that our international funds transfer system was hacked. So they wanted me to go out and meet the top 20 international banking customers and make sure that uh, we didn't lose too many customers. And that revolved around my meeting with these 20, 20 CFOs, uh, VPs of finance, and speaking to them in terms of here is what, you know, what happened and here's why it happened and here's why it will not happen going forward. But it was addressing the issue in terms they understood. That was fine. Uh, the other is 
blank check. Go do some, go, you know, build the best apartment that existed anywhere at the time. This was 1995. Uh, and I was able to hire, or had the budget to hire anyone I wanted to hire, which was great. Uh, I did, you know, I did some speaking, so people you know, threw resumes at me, which was great. Uh, but the challenge, the challenge I had, and, and it sort of, and when I, I so I, again, I had this vision of I'm running a business within a business. I am the CEO of this thing called the Corporate Information Security Office. The first person I brought on was effectively my chief operating officer. I knew I had to do a lot of running around the globe and running around meeting not only the customers that we were impacted, but also meeting with uh, the heads of lines of business around the globe. The city was in 120 countries, uh, meeting the ge geographic leadership and evangelizing the program and you know, letting them know why we're there, why it's important, but why it's important to them, which meant they needed somebody back in New York keeping the wheels on the bus so it didn't, didn't fall apart. So I had this guy, Jim, working for me. Uh, without him at my side, it never would have happened because we had an incredible partnership. Uh, and he had a data center operations background. Uh, the next person I brought on is, is essentially became my chief technology officer. We also brought on somebody who eventually became my, the equivalent of my chief marketing officer. We had, to, we had to go sell a program that didn't exist. I also had to bring on my own chief financial officer. Uh, we came up with a concept at the time called the, the BISO, the BISO, which is standard operating procedure today didn't exist in 1995. He said, okay, how do we make this thing important? And the decision we made was, we wanted this BISO to be part of the line of business, reporting into the line of business, and then heavy title of line into me. Uh, and what we did with that, which, which was great at the time, we put together a, B, a BISO training program. We certified the, we certified the BISOs and certain amount of efficiency and security. We had monthly calls uh, and they became our eyes and ears into the line of business and they provided the business input back to us. So they tried to minimize the number of stupid things we would do. Uh, but they were part of a very special club. Uh, we had an annual offsite for them, which was a, you know, a training, you know, three days of training, uh, decent facility, uh, you know, they, had, they were appointed by the heads of the lines of business. So that, you know, exposure to a level of management they otherwise would not have. Uh, and they, they were able to take the security program that was developed at a corporate level and made it real in each one of the lines of business. We also set something up, which was the, uh, is, you know, a, the equivalent of that, which was a security technology lead who was part of infrastructure. We reported to the head of infrastructure and tied it into me. We also set up regional information security officers who were part of my team that represented what we were doing to the geographic regions that we're part of. And I also wanted to make sure that they were at least um, you know, multilingual, in many cases, dual-lingual, uh, trilingual, so to be able to explain a lot of what we're doing to the, ge the specific geography of where I'm working. Uh, and then I spent a lot of time going around the globe talking about what we're doing, why we're doing it, why it was important, how it helped their lines of business. Uh, if it didn't provide, uh, if it didn't solve or address a level of business risk, it wasn't important to them or to me. So, and I met with them regularly. I met with the risk committee regularly. I met with the audit committee of the board also fairly regularly. My whole approach has been here are the risks that we're trying to address. Here's why it's important. Here's what we're looking at. Here's the impact of something. What to go wrong? By the way, it will go wrong. And here's how we're dealing with this whole topic of resiliency. So the cow will fall in a ditch. We want to get the cow out of the ditch pretty quickly. And then we want to make sure the cow doesn't fall in that ditch again. And it'll fall in another ditch, but... Um, not, not in the same one. Not in the same one. <laughs> Everything was... You know, trying to put something, give it a very, explain something in a very meaningful way. Like, what, what is the business impact of what we're doing? Why is it important? Here's what the risk is to your business. 
The other thing we do is Sorry, I'm going to pause you there. Because uh, you're talking about storytelling here, and you, you describe traveling the world, uh, effectively telling these stories, right? Making risk understandable, helping the business understand what they might face and the likelihood of that. And I doubt you used the uh, cow falling in the ditch. Maybe you did. Maybe you used the cow falling in the ditch story. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> there, I did. Are there other, <laughs> any other stories you can tell, and not event-driven, but any other defining moments where – you could see the eyes light up for the your your peers and the executive staff and the board saying, "Ah, yes, now I understand." And I give you two. metaphors that work. I will I will give you two, and again they were sort of kind of event driven. Uh, when I was still back at Morgan Guarantee, uh, Peter Tippett, who was a legend in the solar information security area, came to demonstrate a PC virus product. He was the founder of a company called Novi. And he came into my area and uh, put a five and a quarter inch floppy into a few of the desktops in my area. And sure as heck, we had a couple of viruses. So I went to my, I, you know, went to my boss and said, you know, Bill, I talked to you about this virus stuff. And he said, uh, don't have time now. I'm going to uh, prepare for my uh, presentation to the board tomorrow. Why don't you catch me for the meeting, brief me so I can go in there and uh, talk to them as well. So I get to see him the next morning. He was on at 10 o'clock. I got there about 5 to 10. Told him what we found. He says, Yank, uh, go take the first five minutes of my, of my presentation. Now you got a picture of the boardroom at Morgan Guarantee. It was like a bigger than a football stadium. It looked even bigger as you walk in the first time and huge table. And I said, Oh gosh, what the hell am I doing here? Um, and so I introduced myself. Uh, part of the data security department. I said, you know, and then then they came out. You know, have you have any of you folks heard on the you know, on TV newspaper about these things called computer viruses? And a few of the hands went up. Like actually, most of them went up. I said they are. I said they are real. I said what I'd like you to do for a minute is picture yourself downstairs in our trading room. Fives become eights. Sixes become nines. Threes become zeros. What does that do to us? And you watch eyes get, just get huge. Like, and somebody finally had the courage to say, can that really happen? Well, at the time, not quite, because the virus is not that sophisticated. But I said, oh, oh, absolutely. Can you stop it? And I said, I cannot stop it, but it can reduce the risk. Two lessons. Tell a story that gets people to shake their head and understand. And I say, I cannot prevent risk. I can reduce it. And I said, well, how much do you need? And I said, $400,000. I said, you've got to just go do what you need to do. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> As I am, you know, saying yes with my head. I mean, this is a podcast, but figure it out. <laughs> Sean is doing the same. Exactly. The other is also event driven. Uh, I had to go out and talk to the, uh, top 20 city bank, city, uh, city corp customers who were, part was, you know, who were part of the funds transfer system. And I went to them with, I think it's six, I'll go over with you, some very simple questions. Do you care who you're talking to? Uh, once you know who you're talking to, do you want to be able to control what they do? Is, is, do you want to keep information private? Uh, are you interested in, are you concerned about the integrity of information? And if there's a problem, do you want to know about it and how soon? Didn't mention, I didn't mention a how. He just asked some very simple questions. And then I said, here is how City is doing it, answer these questions right now. And here's how we're going to be answering them in six months. And here is why it's better. But the initial discussion was, are these things important to you as a business, as a treasurer, as a chief financial officer? Executives really, I, they may give lip service, or the executives really, are, or boards of directors, are not, you know, they're not really that concerned about security. It's not a very sexy topic. And when security people go in and start speaking gate speak, you just, they guys, their eyes glaze over. But they are concerned about business risk. And one of the things I had my teams do regularly, and everyone I hired, my direct reports and two downs, I, I said, 
every business executive and every board member knows they're there because they are very, very bright. In most cases, that's true. In some cases, it may not be true, but they really believe they're very smart. When you go in and present to them, and you will, and they don't understand what you're presenting, they know they're smart enough to understand it, and so they will believe that you are too incompetent to get the idea across. And I said, I can, and I want to make sure that no one on my team is ever viewed is ever viewed as being incompetent. I'll give each one of you one shot at incompetence, not a second. When you're going to present something. Think it through and then go home and present it to your grandmother. If your grandma understands it, the board will understand it. And they will drive, dive deeper if they want to. But I, neither of us can afford to get phone calls about incompetence. From, from grandma. We lose them, we lose budget, we lose credibility. You don't want to hear that from grandma. No. Because you're also not well, getting cash good, from her. Grandma's good graces for sure. You're not going to get the budget either. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Steve. I, in your first example, you were presented with something that you hadn't perhaps seen before or knew that risk existed before. So I want to talk to you about uh, the concept of ambiguity. And I think that's probably the one constant in the role over the years is there's plenty of ambiguity, things you don't know of yet that you have to figure out. And then and then you get the fun challenge of figuring out how to determine the risk and then how to mitigate that risk and then how to tell that story to get the budget as Marco pointed out. So in terms of ambiguity, what, how do you, how do you manage that personally in your different roles over the years? And as you're advising other CISOs, how do you help them assuming that this is a challenge? How, how do you help them deal with it? I mean, every, you know, everything in life is a trade-off, the risk, risk reward trade-off. And there, I guess, is what you, you know, how you're looking at ambiguity. You turn left or you turn right. And then the first thing you need to do is recognize you need to, if you're going to be successful in a CISO role, you have to be committed to defining what your job is and what your job is not. Your job is not to eliminate risk. <coughs> you mean not to eliminate risk because you can't. Uh, your job is not to manage risk which you can't. Your job is to be a risk advisor, because you can be. And your job is to explain, you know, an issue to whether it's a board or an executive saying, here is a threat that, you know, that we're facing. We can't assume it will never happen to us. But if it does, this is the impact. And if we look at the impact, we can pretend, and I don't like the, I mean, we tend to be real, really good at risk and residual risk. Uh, I try not to use, you know, residual risk. We can reduce risk, you know, substantially, but we cannot make it go away. And path A takes us to, is, you know, silver. Path B is the gold. Uh, path, you know, C is the platinum. Uh, my recommendation is we go with this, and here's why. But it's always been, here's why, and here's a recommendation. I can only make a recommendation to you. Somebody told me, let me go back in the history of this, way back when somebody gave me two wonderful pieces of advice, and I wish I remember who, you know, I could remember who it was. They said that as you move forward in your career, two things to remember. One, learn to be a diplomat, not a politician. Learn, uh, politicians are us versus them. Diplomat is, it becomes a we. And the second is, there are times you're going to get paid to make a recommendation, and times you're going to get paid to make a decision. Know which one you are doing. What are the difference? And when you make a recommendation, don't take it personally. It's just your best recommendation, professional recommendation, recommendation you can provide. It's and not those are, And those are two great advice. Very, very political, <laughs> but in a, in a good way. I, li I like the, the diplomat versus the politician's approach. That's really nice. Um, Steve, as we wrap up with this, I, I'm sure we can keep telling story forever, but 
Um, there, there is one question that, I, and I want to put it this way. I always like to look into the future. I'm, I'm the future guy here. And, uh, and I think about technology. I think about people, how business are going to evolve and how, you know, technology with artificial intelligence and advanced technology. Some people say maybe the solution for all our problems. Some people say, well, it's probably going to be one of the cows of our problem in security, right? So we don't know. But Here's the way I'm going to phrase this question to you from for the first CISO. Do you think there'll ever be the last CISO or are we always going to need one? We will always need one. The same way we'll always need a chief financial officer. The same way we'll always need a chief marketing officer. Uh, you need somebody to focus on, on information and techno technological risk. So it, it will not go away. It will change, and you mentioned AI and ML, and I think this is, I'll leave with maybe this is a final thought and just want to continue from here, and I've, I've said this before. And then the, the picture I have is, picture yourself looking at some sort of a painting, uh, an impressionist painting, and, but you're wearing the wrong glasses. <laughs> so you're taking something that's fuzzy and you're making it horribly fuzzy. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of what our environment is today. That's a lot of how we assess our environment today. So I explained that to somebody. I explained this to a wonderful gentleman who has his PhD in particle physics and moved into the uh, risk area. And I said, what I'd like from you is I get data, you know, we can get data feeds from everywhere in the world. Every, you know, threat hunter will send data feeds. Uh, every... My manufacturer will send you vulnerability information. We will have any kind of internal feed that talks about a vulnerability management program, a control management program, blah, 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 on and on and on. I said, I want you to take this all into one huge soup and get back to me and help me figure out what I should focus on. What do I need to think about? He said, I have to be more specific. And I said, honestly, if I, I said, you have a PhD. I said, if I could be... If I was smart enough to be more specific, I'd have your job making what you're making. Uh, <laughs> so take it, you know, take it as a, as, a, as a thought. It may not be something you want to solve, but somebody will. So if I were sitting back in my city role, I would really be pushing my vendor community to say, hey, am I out of my mind? How do we make this happen? And maybe three or four of you get together and figure it out. Love it. He humans humans need to be involved. What I'm, hearing, what I'm hearing is you're, you're not worried a robot's going to take your job. No. <laughs> no no, no uh, uh, robot. The only, robot I, the only robot I want is a Roomba. There you go. <laughs> very useful. Very specific. <laughs> very narrow. <laughs> but, you know, I use AI slightly differently. We use artificial intelligence. And when I look at the, the combined AI, ML, I'm looking for augmented intelligence. Yeah. Give me the information to help me make a decision. You still, need to think. still need to think. Yeah, I, don't I, make I, the decision for me. Yeah. Somehow, the you know, idea of having autonomous AI ML scares a living for Jesus out. <laughs> you know, I, I had this horrible thought of having a, you know, an autonomous drone that looks down and is capable of taking out a target all on its own. And, and as, uh, that's really, really cool, uh, Steve. And as we... As we come to the close here, um, I, I wanted to highlight the, the fact that you, what I heard you say is the CISO role isn't a person. The CISO role is a group of people operating together, serving a function of the business in, in risk management. And so with... You got it perfectly. Perfect, 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 perfect. Love, perfect. love that. Once in a while, I get something right. Um, <laughs> I remember to, to, to uh, say it right. But anyway, right, right with that in mind, the, the, future of, the future of the CISO role, can you maybe just quickly highlight the different functions within the CISO role? You, you touched on a little bit more, but kind of the future. Where do you see that headed? I would prefer seeing the CISO becoming the CIRO, or say the CISO, or reporting to the corporation's chief risk officer and being a peer of all CIOs. Executives and boards are interested in risk. They can, couldn't give a rat's tail about security. Uh, so perhaps the, the coining of the CISO 
title way back when. I'm not putting this on you, Steve, but maybe that, that wasn't the right. Uh, he didn't choose thing. that. I know. You, you don't we, choose your own. Meeting, maybe that was purposeful. You don't <laughs> choose your own title unless you're like, you know, your majesty or something like that. <laughs> oh, it, his royal highness didn't quite make it. I was called a lot of things. <laughs> 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 that, that oh, make can't, the cut. can't put in a podcast. <laughs> who knows? Who knows what uh, what the the next uh, CISOs in uh, I don't know fifty, a hundred years from now? Who knows what they're going to be called? Like, okay. but the first worst prediction, the worst prediction I ever made in this role was in like nineteen ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand. I said, in ten years, we'll work ourselves out of a job. Nah, didn't he's, quite happen. He's still still working in the next ten years. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> only if you can help us find a land. There you go. And with that hope, I think yes. we're at the end of the chapter here. But Steve, I I really love your your story. I mean, I can tell you that part of your success in your career has been the capacity to tell stories. And Sean and I consider ourselves storytellers in a way or in another. We help people tell stories and. Uh, I have to tell you, it was one of the easiest job we have ever, ever had today to let you tell the stories because you're absolutely fantastic in that. So I want to thank you for for these. And uh, anytime you want to come back, I think uh, the door is open and I love Please. to spend time with you again. Yeah. Just let me know when and uh, happy to make the time and say hi to Diana for me. I uh, certainly we will. will. We'll, we'll see. Just, Maybe next time we'll go the four of us together. That will be that'll even better. That Let's do that. Better. All right. Officially. And just and just <laughs> just a quick note. Um, and I want to thank you, Steve, for uh, taking this time. But we all we know first to market doesn't mean that that's always is the most successful product. So I think you you took a role and you carried that torch well obviously over the years and uh, I think that that's worth recognizing I know you've been recognized uh, for that in other ways by other folks but I just wanted to say thank you for carrying that torch and, and then sharing your wisdom with others uh, in, in your mentorship so, and, and here with us so thanks okay, thank uh, you if you enjoyed this podcast share ITSP magazine with your friends family and colleagues if you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. Thank you for listening.